Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and myself delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. Each episode, we dissect the decisions and explore the dynamic landscape of local governance. Today, we bring you the letter V, which stands for volunteers. Later in the episode, we will be speaking with Ashley Seymour, the Executive Director of Volunteer Manitoba. But first, as always, Ian, you are back from the Roma Conference in Toronto. How are you? I've been everywhere, man. So I was, uh, I've been, I started off last Friday. I was in La Ronge, did a, three hours in La Ronge in the morning virtually, and then three hours in Knee Hill County and three hills at Alberta in the afternoon, and then off to Toronto for the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association on Saturday. It has been a whirlwind. I'm back home. It got back last night, but uh, it was a fantastic conference to get to be a part of, for sure. We have a lot of stories to cover here, and we want to dive into it. And first, we're going to be starting in the province of Quebec, where the village of St. Petrol, Quebec, is used to receiving attention from outsiders. Tourists flock to the hamlet at the tip of the picturesque Orleans Island to see its French colonial architecture and enjoy the view of Quebec City skyline across the St. Lawrence River. But since the hiring of its new town manager, the allure of the community has recently given way to intrigue. The resulting controversy has rocked the settlement of just over 1,000 residents and led the municipality to send threatening legal notices to almost one-tenth of residents, as well as the local newspaper, and issue a plea from the province to intervene. Now, at least 97 people in the community have received legal letters from the town saying a lawyer representing the group who got the letters. Many of them were signatories of a December 11th petition asking the municipalities to launch an investigation into the process that led to the hiring of the current town manager, Ian. Now, this is a fascinating story to start with, in my opinion. I have to start by asking, how much responsibility does council have in protecting their staff while also protecting the reputation of their community? Sure. Well, ought, 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 they ought not to be mutually exclusive. And in a case like this, uh, I think the reputation of the community, uh, both as a community and as a local government, really do have uh, have can be impacted by what's happening outside the the bounds of the town office, if you like. However, if things aren't happening the way they ought to be happening, the council also has a responsibility to deal with that as well. Based on what we know from the story, the litigious nature of it all indicates that maybe there is something here that council ought to be dealing with, but maybe not be dealing with. So I, the council has to protect their, their employees uh, up to the point where it, be, it doesn't make sense to do anymore. Uh, we, and we've seen this happen in various municipalities that across the country in recent years. So this isn't unheard of. The fact it's such a small town, I think, could be, um, could be circumstantially relevant to this, uh, to this particular case as well. Now, I have never heard of a municipality suing its own residents. Uh, again, again, there have been lawsuits where uh, their own residents will sue the municipality for violations, bylaws, infractions. But I've never heard of a municipality sort of reversing this and saying, don't come for us because you're ruining the reputation of our community with this sort of lawsuit. What's your take on this uh, sort of lawsuit that the municipality is threatening these 97s and the local newspaper with? Isn't this weird? There's that adage about no any what any attention is good attention or something to that effect. In this case, that's obviously not the case. It does seem like a bit of a big stick to be taking against a series of people in a relatively small town of less than a thousand people. When I read the story and thought about it, and it seemed like the town was trying to uh, push these whatever the debate was aside and any sort of issues associated with what's happening there aside as well it reminded me of that um the the uh, the uh, acronym of slap in terms of lawsuits or, st or strategic lawsuits against public participation just as a way to get people to shut up and go away even with just the threat of a lawsuit now of course it's never about what it's about so we don't 100 percent know what's behind all of this and it may be perfectly legitimate they've obviously got a lawyer who's willing to side with the town here and undertake this action. So who knows, right? But it certainly, uh, on the surface at least, at least, 
certainly doesn't seem to be a good use of town resources. The fact that we are speaking about this, you and I, four provinces away, when in reality we wouldn't be talking about this municipality for any other reason, tells me that maybe their idealized course of action isn't one that has been realized. Well, and that that was the area that I wanted to sort of ask as well, because I, as a former journalist, I know covering City Hall, who often relies, newspapers, radios, uh, television stations, rely on municipal advertisements, whether it be through yeah. uh, public hearings, notices, th this, that, or the other. Um, when you are critical of the town in a editorial, they have potentially the ramification to remove some funding from your source sure. of revenue, whether it be newspapers and that. And I looked at this and I found it interesting that the uh, association uh, res uh, responsible for independent journalism in the province also mentioned that you can't be critical where the municipality is saying, well, you get funding from us, so you can't be critical from <laughs> of us. How do, and I, I'm going to ask this as a reporter asking someone who's been in the municipal world, how do councils have to sort of rely on the in, local independent journalist while understanding that their job is to also be critical of you and call you out on your sort of BS when you get into it? <laughs> it bleeds, it leads, right? <laughs> uh, True. It, it, small, I mean, we are small and independent journalism in this country is under threat, just like it is in many other places as well. So the fact there seems to be that entity existing in this town, that's fantastic. If the if the editor or the publisher are actually printing newsworthy stories, whether it's for or against, whether it makes the town look good or bad, I don't I think that that's good for the people who happen to be live there, happen to live in the town. The light being the best disinfectant of things that are not, not going particularly well. I would say though. That if the town, like you had mentioned, if the town is providing advertise is buying advertising from the paper, of course they have an opportunity to to spend those dollars elsewhere. However, if the town is providing some sort of other subsidy to the paper to have it remain open, and the quid pro quo of that is don't print anything bad about us, I've got a problem with that. So, and I have no idea if that's the case. It just the article mentions subsidy, and I don't know quite where that is. I would say too, though. If the council is sorry, if the paper is publishing what occurred in a public council meeting, that's appropriate, as long as it didn't doesn't make allegations of something that can't be proven. And in this case, one of the one of the questions was why they were publishing things that were quote personal and confidential information. I believe about the uh, about the town manager, the CAO, that came out through a freedom of information request. And therefore, it went through the legal system to be determined that it wasn't personal and confidential enough that the freedom of information privacy legislation in Quebec pulled it back. So to me, that that's a bit of a red herring in this whole thing. We're flipping the script in the second story here. We're going from sure. council hiring to the firing of an employee a little bit here. So just over 100 people attended a public meeting in Sturgis, Saskatchewan last week to voice their concerns about the dismissal of a longtime town employee. Some residents who got together to do up a town-wide petition after the former assistant town foreman was dismissed. The petition garnered more than 200 signatures, leading to the public public meeting. Residents and the town councils were in attendance to address concerns from the public. However, during the town meeting, town councils stated they could not disclose why the former assistant town foreman was dismissed due to legal reasons. Many residents addressed their frustration with council's response. Ian, can the town council not defer this decision to the CAO slash town manager of the community as council should not, and I say this, should not be getting involved in the weeds of who to fire, who to hire, since the only staff member council has technically is the CAO and town manager or, or town manager. Right. In this case, it's an administrator because it's Saskatchewan. Doesn't seem to be a CAO specifically, but somebody who's got the title of administrator. You're absolutely right, of course. In Canada, councils have a single employee. Uh, we've seen that be questioned sometimes in places like Chestermere, and we've seen the results of what's happened with that in Alberta. But in this case, in Saskatchewan, the affected person isn't a council employee. So it's right and proper the council would not comment on this even if it wasn't for those, quote, legal reasons, they ought not to be commenting on something that is more properly the administrator's role. 
Now, the administrator um, probably ought not to be commenting on it very much either for reasons of, uh, like we had just talked about in Quebec, or for reasons of access to information and protection of privacy. The If the issue was, however, how the administrator dealt with their duties, then it is up to council to deal with that. And that's council's job through their evaluation and evaluation process and all the rest of that. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. The nuance is is not lost on me in that it was a town, a group of town people who organized this public meeting and who seemed to be the ones who were exercised by this particular decision that the, uh, the town corporation had made. It, I wouldn't necessarily expect the 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 people who organized the meeting to know that council only has one employee they just know that they elected town council and town council is not responding to them so they're not getting the answers that they wanted from the people that ought not to be giving them the answers in the first place i appreciate that and for our final story we're going to stay in saskatchewan and head a little bit north Prince Albert City Council voted on Monday to ask the Court of King's Bench to determine if Councillor Tara Lennox Zepp and Councillor Tony Head are still qualified to remain on council. The motion voted on springs from council's debates and votes on the new agreement with QP882, the union representing the city's inside workers. Council approved the agreement at a meeting on December 11th. During the meeting, Lennox Zepp decided to vote on the agreement without declaring a conflict of interest, despite objections from the mayor. Monday's agenda included a report written by the city solicitor. In it, the city solicitor writes that the city has received a privileged and confidential legal opinion from the law firm Brownlee LLP, saying councillors are in conflict of interest if they are employed by or have spouses employed by QP Union in the city workplace and administration being forward matters involving motions, discussions, deliberation, debate, information, or voting on collective bargaining negotiations. Councillor Lennox Zepp's husband is listed as a staff advisor for Region 2 of the Prince Albert QP Area Office on the QP Healthcare Workers Local 5430 webpage. The councillor's husband has been assigned to work with QP882 in the past, and at the December meeting, Lennox Zepp said he is not currently a member of the QP team negotiating with the city of Prince Albert. Now, councillor Head, on the other hand, spent nine years as a former QP national representative before being elected to council. Prior to that, he worked for the city of Prince Albert in the collections and distribution department. Now, Ian... How important is it for municipal councillors, municipal leaders to know when to declare a conflict of interest, particularly when it comes to matter of family members as well as their own conflicts? Sure. It's vitally important. It's, it's, it's seeing the law, not only doing the right thing, but being seen to be doing the right thing, modeling the behavior that we expect of other people, I meaning separate and apart from this particular case. So I think it's really important. I will note too that the provincial legislation around around how municipal councillors are affected by conflicts of interest changes from province to province. So wherever you are watching or listening from, it's likely, unless you're in Saskatchewan, the rules are slightly different in Saskatchewan than they are with you. Generally, very similar. Don't do it. And stay away from the debate. Don't vote on it. All of those sorts of things are, are pretty consistent. In some provinces, voting on a conflict of interest matter when you knew there was one could be a, a that could cause the dismissal of a member of council. It also brings the council's decision that was made based on that vote in which someone should not have voted come into question as well. You made a reference to a law firm that had advised the city on this case. In in my estimation, the law firm you mentioned is is very reputable, and I certainly would not question whatever it is that they had brought brought. Uh, in terms of, of uh, advice to the city. That said, you and I only really know what the story says here. And there are two councillors, uh, both of whom seem to be in a slightly different position. You mentioned one member of city council whose spouse is um, works as member of CUPE, and therefore there would be, I would see anyway, an inherent conflict of interest, uh, for better or for worse, based on city council's decision about a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, the spouse is going to benefit or not based on uh, whatever the agreement happens to be and whatever city council votes on. The other case, however, to me anyway, on the surface is somewhat different in that it is another member of city council who previously was part of the, the collective bargaining group, 
but my estimation would be that that's probably not the case anymore and as such would not necessarily be a conflict of interest again i, I want to refer back to the uh, the law firm's comments and to me conflict of interest typically you mentioned uh spouse family usually conflict of interest is a, a benefit or a detriment to me to my family and all families defined differently in different places so sometimes it's spouse sometimes it's parents kids sometimes it's all the people who live in the same house as me so that group and usually my employer is also included as a conflict of interest where most municipal most municipal councillors aren't full time in the municipality they also work somewhere else and as such if they're somewhere else benefits from whatever decision the council makes then that would also be a conflict of interest. So I think, Chris, you asked a fairly short question and I give you a really long answer. When a counselor is faced of, with a moral dilemma of a particularly around a conflict of interest, you've worked with municipal leaders, you've done orientations with municipal councils. What advice do you give them? Is it better to err on the side of caution than just go and do it and hopefully nothing comes from it? Or is it prudent for counselors who are potentially facing these conflicts of interest to seek out legal advice? Obviously, I would say, I shouldn't say obviously, it's to seek out legal advice. And because the rules on, on voting or not voting are dependent on province to province. In some provinces, if you don't vote when you're supposed to, it's a disqualification offense. In other provinces, you can abstain from a vote if you see fit. So it depends on where you live. But that's one of the reasons that uh, during an orientation, we'll often talk about a municipal legal opinion and a personal legal opinion, that you know that land sale is coming. And if you're going to divide your lot and you're going to benefit, you ought not to participate in that debate or in that vote. But when it comes to what do we do about the hangers, hanger fees, that's something that would be useful to get a more uh, specific legal opinion on. It, and it's so different across the hard to come up with anything that's universal. It's true. We'll be right back with Ashley Seymour, the Executive Director of Volunteer Manitoba. Welcome to V is for Volunteers on the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Ashley Seymour, the Executive Director of Volunteer Manitoba. Volunteer Manitoba stands as a steadfast pillar, nurturing the spirit of volunteerism and fostering collaboration within the dynamic landscape of Manitoba's community sector. Their unwavering commitment revolves around supporting individuals eager to contribute their time and skills, as well as empowering community agencies, nonprofits, and charities that form the backbone of vibrant, the vibrant province that is Manitoba. By championing the volunteer sector, Volunteer Manitoba plays a pivotal role in enhancing the capacity to anticipate, celebrate, and address the diverse needs woven into the fabric of the province. Volunteer Manitoba envisions a future where it serves as the leader and catalyst engaging all Manitobans in the spirit of volunteerism, thereby shaping a stronger, more connected province. So with that, welcome to the Political Trenches, Ashley. Thank you for having me. So Ashley, I'm going to kick off the line of questioning here, and I want to start by getting to know about the organization a little bit. And how does Volunteer Manitoba support individuals who wish to contribute their time and skills to volunteer work in their community? Yeah, so Volunteer Manitoba has actually been in existence now for, oh, almost 50 years. Um, we're we're going to be approaching our 50th anniversary in the next few years, which is really exciting. And over the years, you know, it certainly evolved um, just to keep up with the times and the trends um, that we face here in Manitoba. Um, so in terms of, you know, our current work and what we're doing to support volunteerism and connect folks, um, we, we do that in a number of ways. So we offer a referral service. Um, folks often will either drop by our office, they'll call or email, letting us know that they're looking to get involved, that they're looking for a volunteer opportunity, and they really have no idea where to start. Um, so we're able to sort of walk them through a few different options. Um, one of the pages on our website is dedicated to posting volunteer opportunities that are available across the province. So many, many nonprofit and community-based organizations come to us they post their opportunities, 
And that way, when people also come to us looking to volunteer, that we're able to connect them with those opportunities that are available. We can support people by sort of narrowing down what their interests are, um, how much time they're able to commit, maybe what area of the city or the province that they're looking to, to get involved. Um, do they have particular interests, um, skills that they're looking to give back? Um, and so based on sort of those conversations, we're really able to connect people with the opportunities that are available in their desired communities. Hmm. I'm going to jump in if I can now too, actually. Uh, you've talked quite a lot about uh, about the concept of volunteers and where are the volunteers coming from these days? We hear a lot about things like volunteer burnout and it's the same old, same old people. Where are the new people coming from? And maybe I'll address my second question right now too, is how do we address things like volunteer burnout? Yeah, and so that's been very interesting, sort of post pandemic, um, you know, it's no secret that volunteerism is on a bit of a decline from what it was before. Um, and that's certainly due to a number of factors, you know, people are maybe a little bit more selective with their their spare time, the pandemic has taught us, you know, sort of how to value our time a little bit differently. So trying to re engage those volunteers that were very active before the pandemic. Um, that's definitely been a challenge. Um, we're also seeing, you know, with the challenging economic times that we're in, that people need to work more, right? People need to earn more money. And so their disposable time is not that readily available. Um, so I kind of go back to my earlier comment about we're really trying to engage with students. Um, we do a lot of work with newcomer serving organizations because there's such tremendous value to that community to you know do some volunteering it helps you to learn about your community make those social connections develop some skills um, so they've been a really valuable um, group to engage with um, we're also looking to re-engage and reconnect with some of the seniors serving organizations across the province because historically seniors and retired folks and older adults were the ones that were you know maybe had some more time that they were able to give um, and that population, you know, was really highly affected by the pandemic. They were the most high risk. So we're definitely seeing a lot of those folks may be more apprehensive to returning to, you know, what they previously did. And, and that community has aged significantly as well in the last few years. So maybe aren't as active. Um, so, yeah, we've certainly got, you know, our, our ear out there. and We're trying to connect with as many folks as possible. And certainly youth, youth uh, have such a tremendous opportunity to get involved in the community. And so that, you know, we're visiting schools as much as we can to just really instill that importance and that value in, in the younger generation of Manitobans. What's the about the motivation of volunteers? You mentioned generational shifts or at least alluded to them a little bit too. Are you seeing what's motivating a volunteers changing over the years as well? Yeah, I think so, right? Back, I think a number of years ago, volunteerism in certain capacities was just something that people did. Um, and so it's taken a lot of maybe extra effort to educate people about those benefits, right? So when we talk to youth, it's about gaining some skills, you know, you can work on building your resume, um, and maybe the networking component, meeting people where opportunities for future opportunities might arise. Um, and just really finding that value for, you know, everybody else um, in the community as to why, like the importance and the value of getting involved in your community. Um, and so we certainly change our approach depending on the audience that we're connecting with. Um, like I mentioned, newcomers, youth, seniors. And so when we give presentations to these folks, we definitely, you know, sort of target um, our message to that audience. Um, and then we're really looking to try and partner with the Mental Health Association um, of our, our province because there is such positive effects on a person's mental health when they're involved in community and doing volunteer roles. Um, and so we know in our society right now that that can be a bit of a challenge for some people. And so we really, you know, aside from the skills and the, the social connections, um, we really want to sort of focus on the positive mental health benefits that it can bring to you as well. Thanks. Are you seeing one type of sector being in need of more volunteers than others? You talk about uh, community organizations, you talk about nonprofits. Is there one particular area in the province of Manitoba where you're seeing a more 
urgent need for volunteers compared to other sectors in the province or is it just a cross gambit because we talk about the the sort of recruitment of volunteers being a requirement or a need but what are the community organizations the nonprofits telling you or even municipalities because municipalities are uh, often require volunteers as well what are you hearing from the organizations about what their requirements are yeah, it's interesting that it's not really one specific area of the sector. We're seeing a shortage across the board. Um, it doesn't really matter what type of services and programs they offer. Um, everybody has a really big need right now. Um, one thing that is sort of interesting that we're noticing is a real need for people to join a board of a community organization. And so with that too, that's that awareness piece again. Um, traditionally, boards have been led by maybe some older adults or people nearing the end of their careers. Um, and so there's been sort of a stigma around that and an apprehension for younger generations to get involved in a volunteer board of directors. Um, and so we've got a number of postings on our website and we hear from people all the time that have vacancies or shortages on their boards. Um, and so while we fully support people, you know, doing the boots on the ground work, because that's so very important as well, um, you know, the leadership of the organization is equally as important. And so really changing the, the stigma around what that means to be on a board. Um, you know, traditionally, it's sort of been this big, scary beast that it's going to take so much of your time and it carries such tremendous responsibility. And while that you know, can somewhat remain the truth. Um, it's not nearly as as scary of an experience as someone might think. And so um, we're really trying to, again, raise that awareness about that um, and encouraging people to get involved at a board level. Hmm. When it comes to the people who are available, are you finding there are more volunteers than spots available or, or is still demand outstripping supply? Yeah, we're still seeing the demand being much higher than the supply. Um, and I do believe that part of that is, in some senses, the, the awareness. Um, so again, Volunteer Manitoba, we've got some great ideas and strategies going into 2024 about, you know, raising awareness of the importance and the value of volunteerism in the community. Um, because some folks might not be thinking of it, be considering it. Um, and so we're really trying to, you know, put some effort into some marketing around volunteerism in general, right. because there are certainly more positions available than there are interested folks, right? Do you ever find that that uh, volunteers are doing jobs that really ought to be paid jobs? Yeah, that's a bit of a tricky situation. We've come across that a little bit over the years. Um, and that's certainly a conversation that we have. Um, with the organization, specifically if they're looking to advertise on our website, when we can see that, you know, I'm looking for a volunteer to work 30 hours a week to do all the admin and accounting for my organization. That seems like it should be a paid position, right? That's going to be pretty tough to find somebody with those kinds of skills and that much time to volunteer. Um, and so, you know, we have seen that from time to time. But then it's just a matter of having a conversation with that organization and finding out really what their needs are. Um, sometimes that is truly the case. And, you know, again, that's a tough, tough shoes to fill there. But uh, for the most part, I think people are pretty understanding of what the difference really should be between the two. Thanks. Now, I, I know that Volunteer Manitoba and the Association of Manitoba Municipalities just recently partnered up for an award that they're going to be presenting later on this year. I think the deadline just passed as of recording this for submissions. What role does municipalities play in fostering a good community where volunteerism can sort of be fostered? Because recognizing volunteerism is one thing, but not just recognizing it once, but over the course of the year is another thing. What role should municipalities play in supporting and working with these organizations and your organization to celebrate the volunteers that are already there? Yeah, and recognition is huge. Um, it goes so very far. It's again, something we advocate for regularly. Um, and so as somebody who resides in a small town in rural Manitoba, I can see firsthand the impact that volunteers have on our community. Um, there are so many events and programs that just 
simply would not happen if it wasn't for volunteers. Um, and that's the case, you know, across the province, across the country, really. So um, municipalities certainly need to, you know, again, raise awareness in their communities that these programs exist. And they exist solely because of the contributions of volunteers. And then that ongoing recognition and celebration of the commitment of those folks, um, it goes a really long way. People like to be recognized and acknowledged for their hard work. Um, and so it's important to have that ongoing recognition to support the people that are giving back to community. You've left a pretty good, given us a pretty good idea of the state of volunteerism from your perspective in Manitoba, do you do you have any insight into whether it's any different anywhere else across the country, or is it kind of similar? To, do you think Manitoba is kind of similar to wherever else we might be looking? Yeah, absolutely. So we regularly connect with Volunteer Canada, right. um, as well as volunteer centers in different cities and different jurisdictions, um, and we're hearing the same thing from coast to coast that it's been really challenging, um, you know, and certainly depending on where you're located, you have a bigger pool to select from perhaps, right? Like the bigger cities, more population, um, but it doesn't necessarily correlate to their rate of volunteerism always. So yeah, we're hearing that from coast to coast that um, especially since the pandemic, the, mm -hmm. the need for a lot of these services that are offered by community organizations has significantly increased while the rate of volunteerism has either declined or stayed the same. And so people are having, you know, challenges to balance the two of them, trying to meet the demand, the, the increased demand for services with sort of less capacity to do so. So paid staff are taking on a lot of extra work, um, a lot of extra responsibilities and just trying to make sort of make the ends meet at the end of the day. Thanks. We often say that volunteerism is the backbone of any community. They are the ones that make our communities move forward. They are the nonprofit organizations. They are the community groups. Um, we spent the majority of this interview chatting about sort of your organization, but we always like to look at the future at the end of the interview. And I've got to ask, what is Volunteers Manitoba's vision for the future? And I'm going to quote your website a little bit here. How do you aim to be a leader and catalyst in engaging all Manitobans in volunteerism, not just in 2024, but beyond? Yeah, so I think the just being involved in the communities, just getting ourselves out to as many communities and connect with as many, you know, populations and community groups that we're able to, um, you know, again, raising the awareness of the benefits of it. Um, and in a perfect world, we would see such a small list of available opportunities on our website um, because so many of them are filled. But we're also a really strong advocate to ensure that community support, volunteerism remains a key part of like a school curriculum. Some school divisions have that component built in. Um, and so we really want to advocate that that remains so that youth are exposed to volunteerism early on in life and, and can see the benefits of that. Um, you know, and again, connecting with seniors groups, all the different community groups that we have here in Manitoba, um, just being involved and being active um, and being at the table with them as much as we're able to just to to advocate for volunteerism. Um, Ashley, I want to extend my and Ian's uh, gratitude for coming on and talking about volunteerism, but also Volunteer Manitoba. For those who are listening right now, the links to Volunteer Manitoba are in the show notes. So if you're looking to get involved in Manitoba, please scroll down and check it out. But thank you so much, Ashley, for doing this and participating in the show. Oh, thank you both. It was a lot of fun and I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Ashley. Our full interview with Ashley will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. V is for volunteer. We are done another great episode, another great interview with Ashley Seymour. Three great stories we talked about. Ian, how'd you think about the episode? It was funny. We were just saying a little uh, offline, Chris, you and I, that how, uh, how effervescent Ashley was and how much fun it was just to talk to her too. And, Coming off some of the stories that we talked about at the beginning, it was a really good way 
to end off the episode. I did I wanted everyone to realize that I'm wearing my V neck sweater for V is for volunteers today. Um, for those who are watching, uh, I just want to do a shameless plug as, uh, I just want to make sure that people know, uh, if you want another great resource and hopefully Ian is about to hold it up here, go check out his book, the DNA of great leaders. It is a highly recommended, great read cover to cover. Um, just check it out. The link to it will be in the show notes. So check that out. So with that, Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you in the political trenches and talk about the local government and the great work that people do. Greatly appreciate it as always. See you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Talk to you later.